Good morning. It's nice to have this opportunity to be back here and uh, speak with you. I think you all know um, the scripture we're going to look at this morning. You guys have been going through Matthew. And uh, yesterday I was listening to the first three uh, chapters that were done um, just so I could uh, hear what was being said and how you guys were looking at Matthew. <clears throat> I'd like to commend you for doing this, for going through a whole book like, like this. I think it's really, really helpful for, for us that when we take the time to go through a book. We've been doing this in Belleville for a number of years now, actually. Um, I'm part of a men's Bible study, and we, we went through Matthew, I think it was a couple of years ago. And then uh, all the messages were on Matthew. And then we went, we've gone through, uh, I think it's 2 Corinthians, and we went through Daniel, and we're going through Luke now. <clears throat> and so uh, all the messages are on the, the books that we're studying as men together. So it's, re it's really been uh, encouraging for me. This morning, uh, I'd like to read through um, chapter 4. And as I'm reading, just in your mind, just think how many events are covered in this, this chapter. Each writer of the Gospels, when they're, they're writing the events, the accounts of Jesus' life, they, they chose specific events um, because they're trying to convey a certain message to us. And so Matthew has chosen events. And uh, we're going to look at chapter 4. And just in your mind, think how many, how many different events are there here in this chapter? So I'll start reading from verse 1 of chapter 4. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry, and the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him, took him into the holy city, and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, On the other hand it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, go Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. Now when Jesus heard that John had taken in, had being taken into custody, he withdrew into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. This was to fill, fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light, and those who were sitting in the land and and shadow of death upon them a light dawned from that time jesus began to preach and say repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand now as jesus was walking by the sea of galilee he saw two brothers simon who was called peter and andrew his brother casting a net into the sea for they were fishermen and he said to them follow me and i will make you fishers of men immediately they left their nets and followed him Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus was going throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. The news about him spread throughout all Syria and they brought to him all who were ill, those suffering with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. Large crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. Let's just ask the Lord to help us understand his word. 
Father, we just thank you for what we've just read here, what Matthew's recorded of the life of your son. Father, we uh, seek your understanding this morning. We ask that by your spirit, you teach us, open our minds to receive what you've written here for us to understand. And we thank you that we have your word and that we know that you will teach us from it. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. <clears throat> this is a, a really important chapter in the life um, that Matthew recorded in the life of Jesus. There's something going on here. Sometimes um, it's a little bit difficult to understand, at least for me. And, uh, but there's something here that relates to something that happened in the beginning. We have a man here, Jesus Christ, the man Christ Jesus, and he's with Satan. We had a man in the beginning, Adam, who was with Satan and he failed the test. And what was it that, that Adam did that caused him to fail? Was he deceived? No, Adam was not deceived. Paul made that clear to us. But Adam chose something um, that he shouldn't have chose. He chose to do things his way. And he brought sin uh, into the world. And we receive, <laughs> I don't know what you want to call it, but because of his sin, that has passed on to all men, for all have sinned. So, I just wanted to go back and take um, a look at a few verses that you've already looked at, just to kind of get into this chapter 4 here. And, um, so, go back to Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1. There's something here that um, we read just in this first verse. It says, the record of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah. So Matthew sets out right away who he's talking about. Jesus, the man Christ Jesus, the Messiah. He's the one. He's the Christ. He's the one that was promised. He's the one that they were waiting for. And then he says, the son of David and the son of Abraham. Why those two? Why not the son of Jacob? Why not the son of Isaac? Why Abraham and why David? My thinking on this would be, um, and it's interesting, the genealogy here is backwards, right? It starts with Jesus, and then it, then it says the son of David and the son of Abraham. And then right after that, it starts with Abraham, and it goes through down to Christ. Why did God record it that way? He's pointing out something for us. The son of David, because given to David was the promise that someone would sit on his throne, a king would sit on his throne, one of his descendants forever. What was given to Abraham? That through his seed, all nations of the earth, all peoples of the earth would be blessed through his seed. Christ is the seed of Abraham and Christ is the greater son of David. And Christ will sit on that throne forever. That's why it's recorded. That's why Matthew put this here. He's drawing our attention to Abraham. Who is Abraham? Who is David? Abraham was the friend of God, and God said to him, your, your descendants will be so numerous you won't be able to count them. But one, the, from your seed, all nations of the earth will be blessed. David, one of your sons, is going to rule this, not only Israel, he's going to rule the world forever. He's going to sit on your throne forever. That's an eternal throne that um, God is talking about. The next one, um, Matthew chapter 2 and verse 2. And here we have, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Where is the one that's born king of the Jews? He's a king. They recognize them. And you... You learn that these, these men came from the, the East. They had heard something. Whether they were influenced by Daniel, which I highly think is probable, because Daniel lived in Babylon for most of his life. He, he died there. He never went back. He was an old man in his probably 80s, 90s, when he died in Babylon. And he had a great influence on uh, the different um, nations that, that took over that area. So, where is he that, that is born king of the Jews? This is the king. He's here. Where is he? We know he's here. The king of the Jews. 
We've seen his star, a, a miraculous thing. Then, um, let's just go back to 1 verse 21. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Call his name Jesus. Why Jesus? What does Jesus mean? It's, it's, in, in Hebrew, it would be Jehoshua. What does that mean? Jehovah is Savior. That's why you call him Jesus. Jehovah is Savior. He will save his people from what? From, from domination? No, from their sin. That's who he is. He is the Savior. Call his name Jesus because he's going to save people. And then verse 23. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Which translated means God with us. He's God. God is with us. He came into this world. Amazing. God is with us. Verse 25. but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son and called his name Jesus, just as he was told, he called him Jesus. John was called John because an angel told Zacharias to call him John, and the people didn't think Zacharias should call him John because they said, there's nobody in your family named John, and he said his name is John, and then his mouth was opened and he could speak again. Here, they, um, Joseph was call, told to call him Jesus, and he did. And the reason we, we just saw, there's a, his name means something. So. It's not only that he had a name, but that he had a, a characteristic, who he was. He was Emmanuel, God with us. And he's really the only one that could really fulfill the name Jesus, Jehovah's Savior, because he walked and he was and is the Savior. Let's look at um, uh, chapter 2, verse 6. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means among the, the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler, who will shepherd my people Israel. Matthew has contained a lot of stuff in these first two chapters. He's a ruler. Not only is God, he's a ruler, and he's going to shepherd. He's a shepherd. He's going to shepherd my people Israel. Um, <clears throat> and he came out of Bethlehem. Out of you shall come a ruler out of Bethlehem. Who came out of Bethlehem before this? We just read about him. David. The city of David. He came out of Bethlehem. And he's David's um, descendant. Uh, chap uh, chapter 2, verse 14. So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother while it was still night and left for Egypt. And Hosea said, um, Out of Egypt I called my son. Exactly what God said. He took him into Egypt and that's where he came out of. Out of Egypt I have called my son. And then Matthew 3 and verse 3, he said, um, For this is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. That's what John was doing. He was making ready the way of the Lord. So he's Jesus. He's Emmanuel. He's a ruler. He's a shepherd. He's the Lord. He's God with us. He's the Lord. And make his, his paths straight. So John was, was here to prepare people to receive the Lord. Verse um, 11 of chapter 3. He says, As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor, and he will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Wow, who is this person? He said, I baptize you with water, but he's going to baptize you with fire and with the Holy Spirit. A greater baptism than the baptism by water. And he said... He will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. This is who Matthew is presenting to us. The eternal king. God with us. Jehovah. 
He came to earth in the person of Jesus Christ. Then verse 17 of uh, this of chapter 3, and he says, And behold, a voice out of the heavens, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now who is it? It's the Son of God, my beloved Son. And I'm fully pleased. I'm totally satisfied with him. So, that's the prelude to what we see in chapter 4. And why is chapter 4 so important? Well, the first verse said, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. This was after his baptism. So he's led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. Who led him there? The Spirit. The Spirit descended on him like a dove. The Spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted. This was a spiritual affair. The whole thing was. What's important about that? Because Christ can do nothing outside of what the Spirit desires. He always, always was in fellowship with his Father. He always did what the Spirit would do. Nothing on his own. What was the problem with Adam? He chose to do something on his own. He chose to take matters into his own hand. He chose to make his own decisions. So this is what this temptation is all about. Will this man fail? And Matthew has to point out to us, this man will not fail. Now, some people think, there's many arguments about this, this, this um, chapter, right? Some people say, well, it was impossible for Christ to sin, so it wasn't real a temptation. I, and I've been presented with that argument. But recently, I heard somebody answer that, and I thought, that was a really good answer. So I'm going to tell you what the answer was. He said to this man, <clears throat> who thought, well, Jesus, you know, if he's God, then he didn't. Well, was this a real temptation or not? Well, we're going to look at it, and we'll find out how real it is. But do you remember Job? The man Job. And God pointed him out to Satan. He said, have you considered my servant Job? Not once did God say that to Satan, but twice he said it to him. Have you considered my servant Job? There's no one like him. He's upright. There's not a man like him in all the earth. And he said, he does not fear you for nothing. You protect him. That's why. And he said, okay. You can have all that he has. You don't touch him, but you can take all that he has. And in all this, Job did not sin with his mouth. And then, then God asked him again, have you considered my servant Job? Satan was walking to and fro on the earth, and he said, well, haven't you just considered my servant Job? You moved me against him, and yet he still did not sin. With and then Satan said, yeah, skin for skin. Man will give all that he has for his life. So you let me touch his body. And he said, you can, but you don't take his life. And so Satan did. And in all this, Job did not sin with his mouth, it said. And his wife said to him, curse God and die. And he said, you foolish woman. Should we receive good from the hand of the Lord and not bad? And, and he didn't say anything against God. Now, did God know that Job was going to act in that way? He certainly did. <laughs> he knew for sure. Did Satan? No. Did we? No. But God knew. Did Job? No. Was it a test to Job? You ask him. You get to heaven, you ask him how, how test. You, we have a whole book on it. Certainly it was a, a test for Job. So was this for a test for Christ? Well, let's look. It really was. After he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights. So we have this this 40-day period, and this is through Scripture. Moses went up on the mountain with God for 40 days and 40 nights. What he ate, I don't know. He was up there 40 days and 40 nights, so it's not the first time we read of this. 40 days and 40 nights, and then he became hungry. This is telling us a fact about Jesus Christ. As a man, he was hungry. I guess I would be hungry after 40 days and 40 nights. I don't, I don't know how he made it that long, but we're told he did. He became hungry, and the tempter came at this very time and said to him, if you're the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. If you're the Son of God, you just tell these stones, you could do that. I know you can. But it's the way he, he phrased it. If. If you are. That's a deceiver. If. If. Prove it. In other words, prove it. You say this, you prove it. It's all been declared about you. You prove it now. And he said something back to him. He said, it's written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And, he, and all the quotations we're going to see from Christ come out of Deuteronomy. It's really interesting that they all come from, um, from Deuteronomy. 
And Satan is quoting scripture to Christ too. It doesn't mean when somebody quotes scripture, <laughs> they have a, a good purpose in using it. Satan did not have a good purpose. And what was his, what was his purpose here? What was, what was Satan's main purpose here in, in quoting scripture and trying to say this? He was trying to get Christ to act outside of what the Spirit would direct him to do. If he could do that, he would fail. Satan knows what's coming. The demons knew what's, what's coming. When this, when this man, Jesus, came on this earth, they knew what's coming. And he wants to cause him to fail. Why? We're, it's, it's included in the scripture, one of the reasons why. Um, next, then the devil took him to the holy city, that would be Jerusalem, and it had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. In other words, the scriptures say that you will be protected. You can't get hurt like this. So you prove it to me then. I want to see you fulfill the scripture. That's what I want to see. Prove it to me. And again, will he act outside of the, the will of God? Will he choose to do something on his own? Well, what did Christ say? Jesus said to him, on the other hand, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Satan, you should know this. You did it. Look what happened to you. You will not put the Lord your God to the test. And so, again, he rebuffs Satan with a scripture, and he says, I am not going to listen to you. Now, these, these um, I've heard these uh, temptations compared to the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. In Luke, they're actually in that order. In this, in Matthew, they're they're in a different order than in Luke. But that, as whatever that may be, we know what was happening here. Satan was using every means he could to try and get Christ to do something that his father had not told him to do. If he could just make him do something the father had not told him to do, this man would fail. And it says, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, in verse 8, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all of these things I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. This is really important, what, what Satan says here. He showed him all the kingdoms of the world, all of them. And he said, all of these things I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. Weren't they Christ? Aren't all the kingdoms of the world Christ? How did Satan get them? Christ does not argue with the fact of what, what Satan said. Satan is not offering something that he knew that was not something he could actually tempt Christ with. All the kingdoms of the world. He is the God of this age. He is the ruler of darkness. This whole world lies in the wicked one. We never should forget that. We're, we're living in a hostile place, hostile against Christ. They are under Satan's control. It was, how did he win that control? He won it from Adam when he got Adam to disobey. If he can defeat Christ here, it's over. They will never go back to God again. It would be over. This is what he's trying to do. Is this real? Like, in this place, isn't this what Christ came into the world to do? To win the kingdoms of the world? Isn't he going to rule the, over the whole world? Yes, but it's not his time yet. But this was a, a real offer. No cross, no suffering. But ought not Christ to have suffered first and then enter into his glory? So he's making a real offer to him. He has these kingdoms. We're living in a hostile world. Don't, we cannot align ourselves with it. Be very careful how you treat this world and where you align your allegiance where you take your ideologies from, where your motivations come from. This world is motivated against Christ. It's so obvious in the day we're living in right now. If we really look, we'll see. Look at what's happening. Russia's on the move. Where does scripture tell us they're going to end up eventually? There's things happening in our world. They're not motivated by God. Sure, they're under the sovereign hand of God, but yet Satan has been given control as far as God will let him have it. But he has these kingdoms. So what does Christ, just fall down and worship me. Be careful who you worship. It's, it's the same thing he's, he's offering to all mankind, worship me. 
things will be good. Worship me. So we have to be careful what, what we're, we're listening to and what's motivating us. So Jesus said to him, go, Satan. So just, in other words, get lost. This is enough. It's written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. I would never bow to you. I will worship the Lord and serve him only. That's what it says. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And recently I was reminded, if you want to see what you worship, so the, it, it kind of shocked me when I heard this. I, I was, we were watching a, a video series. I watched it with a, a, a group of guys, and it's, it's to help in a certain area. It's helped to get free from bondage. And so one of the guys said, what, if you really want to see where your worship is, see where you go when you want to get medicated. Now, what does he mean by that? Where do you go when you've got stress and trouble in your life? What do you go to to get relief and comfort? Is it God or is it something else? And when we see that, it's, then you can evaluate your life. Where do I go? It's kind of shocking sometimes. You think, where do I go? Where do I go? Is it the television? Is it the internet? Is it something else that I go to when I'm stressed and troubled and I need an escape? Is it is it God? Do I find my, we were singing about this this morning, we read the scripture, my refuge. Do I find it in God or do I find it in something else? And Christ says, Satan, it's written, worship the Lord your God and only worship him and serve him only. So th this was the temptation and Christ passed it because Matthew said all these things about Christ coming up to this. Now prove it. That's what Satan's saying to him. You prove it. I want to see if you really are. And, um, and that's a good way to be drawn into, <laughs> into an argument or into doing something you don't want to. If, you, oh, if you're really a Christian, then, and then we feel like we've got to do something. Quote the scripture, that's all you got to do. And just say, God has said this. So that was the temptation. Was it, was it real for Christ? Yes. Was he hungry? Yes, he had a body. When he was taken up on the pinnacle of the temple. And how is he going to get down? He said, well, just throw yourself down. The angels will protect you. You don't have to worry about that. When he's showing all the kingdoms of the world, uh, you can have these easily. Just worship me. And he, he refused it. The temptation actually to him caused him to suffer. It wasn't, it was, it's not like a temptation for us where we have something in us that attracts us to it. There was nothing attractive in, that attracted Christ to these temptations, but they were real and they proved who he was for us. Had we not seen this, I would not know for sure that all these things that Matthew said were true. He had to prove that he was who he said he was and Satan was used to do that. As much as he was presenting temptations to him to try and get him to step outside of God's will, it proved to us that this man would never do anything that was contrary to the will of God, to the will of his Father. He is true. And you know what that proves to me? He can be my substitute. He can take my place. He never did anything outside of God's will. So let's go on in this chapter. Right after this, now, I asked you to try and think of how many events were in there. I see four events. I don't know how many guys you guys came up with when you're reading through. This is the second one. First, we have the temptation. And then right after this, it goes to the ministry of Christ. He's qualified now for ministry. He proved that he can, he's going to do the will of God. And so, Jesus begins his ministry right in verse 12. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been taken into custody, he withdrew into Galilee and leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. Zebulun and Naphtali were the areas where, when Israel first moved into the land of Canaan, they settled Zebulun and Naphtali. They were just north of Galilee. And so that's the area that they're talking about. Um, he, he left Nazareth. You know what Philip said about Nazareth? Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Because Philip was told, we found the Christ. And he, he's from Nazareth. And he's like, 
Nazareth? Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Nazareth was a, was a despised place because of the people that lived there. And he just couldn't believe that the Messiah would come out of Nazareth. But he did. So he, he's leaving Nazareth. He came and settled in Capernaum. And, the, and then in verse 14, this was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. So again, he's following the will of God. Isaiah said, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who were sitting in darkness saw great light, and those who were sitting in the land of the shadow of death, upon them light had dawned. And so, when you read Gentiles here, you can read nations, Galilee of the nations. How did these people see great light? And what light had dawned on them? The Messiah, the Christ of God was there. They, they saw him. What was the light? It was the light of God that they were revealing, being revealed to them, the truth of God. It says, upon them a light dawned. And from that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's not the first time we heard that in Matthew, is it? John had the same message, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What were they talking about? What kingdom? It's not an earthly kingdom they're talking about. They're talking about the kingdom of heaven. And later on, Christ will say, the kingdom is within you. It's, they're talking about something that is spiritual, not something that was physical. Sure, the, the Christ would sit on the throne of David and he'll rule this earth, but not at this time. He was talking about building a spiritual kingdom. And so his message was, was simple, repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, a lot of times we have trouble with this word repent. And I've heard so many definitions, and it's, it's such a simple thing. We just don't have a good word in English that says it simpler than repent. Repent means a change in your thinking. That's what it means. A lot of people associate it with emotions. And sure, and even if I look it up in the dictionary, it will tell me that because it's just the way dictionaries reflect the way people understand words. But it's really not God. He's not saying be emotional because the, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Be sad or be, no, repent. Change your thinking. You guys are thinking wrong. The kingdom of heaven is coming. You guys are looking for the wrong thing. You need to change your thinking. That's what John's message was a message of repentance. You guys need to think differently. What? About what? About who you are before God and about who God is and about how you're going to be connected to God. You guys are all wrong. You're listening to the wrong message. You've got to change. So this is, this is what repentance means. It means we get a change in thinking. I've changed my thinking a lot of times when I read the scriptures, which means I've had a, now I have a different attitude about certain things, a different understanding about sin, about my sinfulness, about God and who he is and what he's going to do. You can talk to people and they'll tell you all kinds of things about God. And they're all, a lot of times they're, they're very wrong. They don't have the right concept of God because it doesn't come from the scriptures. What do they need to do? Repent. What does that mean? They need to change their thinking. How are they going to change their thinking? They're going to hear the scriptures and it's going to change their understanding of God. And they will never think that way about God again. They've repented. So that's what he was saying. You're thinking wrong about the kingdom. You're thinking wrong about God. You're thinking wrong about your life. You need to change your thinking. And, and he's going to tell them what it means. And his message was, repent for the kingdom of, of heaven is, ha is at hand. And he, a great light had dawned on that region. So right after this, he goes into the third event that Matthew wants to talk about. And it's the first disciples. And it's very brief here how these disciples are chosen. Other, other, other writers of the Gospels have different information, but Matthew just in, includes certain things. He was walking by the Sea of Galilee in verse 18. He saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. There's nothing about Andrew going to Peter. There's nothing about P Jesus telling Peter to cast his net into the sea and him getting a big catch of fish and then 
bowing before the Lord and telling him to go away because he's a sinful man. Matthew doesn't include that. He just says they were both there fishing and they were casting that in the sea. And he said to them, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. That's all he includes about, about um, Andrew and Peter here. And it makes sense. He's just presenting to us who Christ is. The King, the Son of God, God with us, the Lord, the Christ, Jesus. And if he would command you to follow, why wouldn't you follow? And so that's all Matthew includes here. So then, and then he says, going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And they did the same thing. Immediately, they left their boat and their father and followed him. No questions asked. They just followed him. And that's the calling. We have four disciples called here now. These men that were called, there, there's something interesting about them. They're called disciples, but so were other people called disciples. John had disciples. Jesus had many disciples, but of these ones that were told that he called, eventually we're going to be told that they were also called apostles. And uh, this is the starting of their ministry uh, with Christ and Christ's ministry to them. They're going to walk with Christ and they're going to learn from him. And they're going to be given certain abilities, certain powers, and a certain understanding. And then we're going to see them after Christ is risen from the dead and how they respond to that. And after they see him going up into heaven and what's told to them. And then the Holy Spirit coming down. And there's 120, about 120 disciples there when the Holy Spirit came. But the, the disciples were there, the 12 that followed Jesus. There was 12 and then they were called apostles. So the apostles were there. What's important about the apostles? Because our whole life is based on the words that the apostles gave us through these scriptures. We're built upon the foundation of the apostles. Christ is the chief cornerstone, but we're built upon the foundation of the apostles. We can never neglect, neglect what God did through these men. He gave us the scripture through these men. He gave us this New Testament through the apostles. We have the apostles and they, they gave us, the, the, the church was built on their foundation. That, that's how important these men, men were. And that's why, when Christ chose them, um, he had a specific purpose in mind for these men. As rough and as unbelieving sometimes as they were, he brought them to a place of great understanding. And then through the spirit that he sent after he went to heaven that indwelt them, God breathed these scriptures to us. So these were important men and, and Christ has, has chosen them. And, and I mean, he's going to have to deal with these men through his whole ministry and their misunderstandings. And he does. And he brings them. It's amazing how he brings them into a greater understanding. And they actually couldn't even have the fullest understanding that they needed until the Holy Spirit came. So the next event is his ministry in Galilee. It says, Jesus was going throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. That's amazing. I think it's amazing, and, and I'll tell you why it strikes me so much, that he healed every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. Wouldn't we just love that to happen today, that every sickness could be healed, every kind of disease? He was just able to do that. Didn't matter what it was. Um, and the reason I find this so, so fascinating in some ways is because when I lived with a people group in, in, uh, in Ivory Coast, I wished I could do this. I never saw so much sickness as I did in that village we lived in and from around that area. And people would come to us as if we could do something about it. And I'm just like, Lord, I can't do anything for these people. Like, I can't. We can drive them to the hospital. We could give them medicine if we had it. We could do something. But some of these things that they suffered, like, I don't know. Who knows what, what it was? Every kind of disease. And I, and I saw so much death 
in that village. Like it, it just was overwhelming at times. Didn't matter what age people were. There's just things that would happen and they would die. We drove a young girl, 16 years old. We, we, she had malaria. She only got it a couple of days before or did the day before. And she started having convulsions because it had um, multiplied in her body so much. And it, what it does is it attacks the red blood vessels. So we drove her to the hospital, 16 years old. And I knew her brother. They weren't communal people, but they were living in the village. And I knew her brother really well. He actually did all the drawings for our literacy books. He did the pictures that were in it. He was a good artist. So we drove him and his sister to the hospital, dropped her off at the hospital, and thought she was going to be taken care of. And the nurse was negligent. He didn't do anything right away. We drove back a half hour later. We went in the room and she was convulsing on the bed and we went and got the nurse. He came back, stripped her and put a fan and wet towels on her right away. He, he took her temperature and he wouldn't let us see it. He shook the thermometer down right away because it was through the roof and she died. And that was really, like, that was really, really sad. And you just wish, I wish I could heal diseases, but I can't. But Christ could. Everything. Didn't matter what it was. And he was preaching the gospel of the kingdom. What is the gospel of the kingdom? It's not the gospel of salvation that we have. It's a, it was good news. It was good news about the kingdom that he would rule. That's what he was telling them about. There's a coming kingdom. I'm the king. That's what Matthew is telling us. This is the king. He's here. And there's a kingdom coming. But... Christ was more concerned about the spiritual kingdom than the physical kingdom at this point. And he said, I came into this world to save sinners from their sins. So he was preaching this gospel to them, this gospel of the kingdom. And then it says in verse 24, the news about him spread throughout all Syria. Well, you can imagine when everybody was being healed of every kind of disease and every kind of sickness, that news would spread. Get to him. If you can get to him, you will be better. We just got to get you to him. So the news began to spread. And they brought to him all who were ill. They just kept bringing people. Those suffering with various diseases and pains. Demoniacs. He could actually command demons to leave people. And they would. That's not something we experience, I don't know, here in this country. Right? We don't really see, think of somebody and say, oh, they're possessed by a demon. Although I've read books and, and people have described what demon possession is, is like in this, in this. And it was through some things they were following and different types of meditation. And, and I read a book by one guy who became a believer and he had three, what he called spirit guides that would speak to him and tell him things. Now, they didn't possess him, but they, he was actually influenced by them. And he said when he became a Christian, they left. He never heard from them again. But in Africa, we, I don't know. You, I would wonder, I can't, I, I just don't know. But I've seen some really strange things. And I've seen even one of the elders in the, in, in the, the assembly I was attending, we were out in a village and they brought this girl to him. <laughs> And he said she's demon-possessed. And he read scripture to her, and that made her very uncomfortable. That's the way they handled it. They would read scripture and pray, and read scripture and pray. And um, if the person gets saved, it's funny. As soon as Christ comes in, the demon goes. But any, anyway, he could do that. The demons knew who he was, and they obeyed him. Epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. He healed them all. He healed them. What a guy. When, that's, that's the guy you want to know, this guy. He's got all this power, and he healed them. And the, the interesting thing, you know, when they looked at this man, what did they see? Matthew's told us things about him, who he is. What did they see when they looked at Christ? When they looked at this man, Jesus, what did they see? They saw a man. They saw the carpenter's son. That's what they saw. They saw Jesus of Nazareth walking among them, but he could do all these things. And, and eventually some people recognized who he is. It says large crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis. The Decapolis is a region right beside Galilee. And Jerusalem, that's down um, south of Galilee. And Judea, that's the regions just south of Galilee. 
and from beyond the Jordan. And that would be on the get my east side of, of, of Galilee, across the Jordan. And these people from all this area in the, um, would follow him and know who, what he could do. And they were, were learning who he is. This, this is the man that they saw. But at the beginning of this chapter, we see who this man really is. He's the conquering one. He never failed. He defeated Satan, and he will. Now, this wasn't the only time he would be tempted by Satan, and this wouldn't be the only time um, he would suffer in being tempted. But we know he, he never failed. He always did the will of his Father. Always. That qualifies him to be my Savior. That qualifies him for everything that Matthew said about him. He never failed. As a man, he never failed. In flesh and blood, he never failed. Think of that. Think of one person that has not failed. You can't. Only him. No human being has ever walked like this man has walked. And he's our Savior. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what Matthew recorded for us. Father, you inspired him to write these things in the order he did. You inspired him to include what he did uh, for your purposes. And Father, we see in what he's written, the man Christ Jesus, who is your son, who is the king, who is the eternal one. And Father, now we know that he is our savior. Light has been shown to us. Father, we see the truth. And we know that there's no salvation outside of him. Father, thank you for sending him. Thank you for caring for us. And thank you for saving us. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you very much.